I was so excited to get my shipment from Last Bottle Wines in the mail the other day full of incredible red wines all from Napa Valley. I love wine tasting, so having this to my door couldn't be happier. Also couldn't be more excited that today's episode is brought to you by Last Bottle Wines. If you don't know already, they're a Napa-based online wine shop with a twist. They offer just one hand-picked wine per day until it sells out, and they're always at incredible prices. We're talking 30 to 70% off retail. And the best part is that there's no subscriptions, no fees, and no minimum purchase. And I could not be more excited to bring this offer right now because they're having a marathon sale, which is coming up March 28th and 29th. Even better, we're offering Dateable listeners 10% off your first order with code Dateable. So if you are a wine lover like me, this is a great time to join. And did I mention that shipping is 100% free? So So what are you waiting for? Mark your calendar for March 28th and 29th or get on it earlier if you want. You can sign up at lastbottlewines.com and use code DATEABLE and find out why Last Bottle is the most fun way to discover and buy amazing wine. This episode is made possible by Badlands Pets. As you all know, Mojo, my precious baby, is the reason why I found love in the first place. He made me feel love again. So I would do anything to ensure his health and longevity. And actress Katherine Heigl and I have that in common. She's helped save over 16,000 dogs through her foundation. And after doing a ton of research, she feels there's one place we can look to to improve any dog's health, and that's their food. So fortunately, she found that just by adding a few special superfoods to her dog's food, she saw huge transformations in their health. So she's made a 20-minute video explaining step-by-step how anyone can do the same thing to see incredible changes in their dog's health. I've definitely re-looked at what I'm feeding Mojo and making sure that hey, he only has one life to live and I want to make sure it's the best damn life. So if you want to keep your dog healthy and happy, go to badlandsfood.com slash dateable and watch Catherine's video right now. Again, that's B-A-D-L-A-N-D-S-F-O-O-D.com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. The Dateable podcast features real stories from real people of how they make modern dating work or not. I'm your host, Yue, former dating coach turned dating insider, if you will. On each episode, you'll hear commentary from my producer, Julie Kraftchik, and other surprise co-hosts. This episode of Dateable is brought to you by 500 Brunches. 500 Brunches connects like-minded people with similar interests to meet in real life over brunch. You answer a quick questionnaire about your interests and how you spend your time, and then they'll match you in small groups of six to eight at a brunch spot in San Francisco. Get a free entry into a brunch now by signing up at 500brunches.com and using the code DATEABLE. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Dateable, a show all about modern dating. On this episode, we're going to revisit the idea of fetishes and in particular diaper fetishes. So if you guys recall from season six, episode 11, we had an entire episode called Diaper Fetish with a guest, Samantha, who was propositioned for a diaper fetish in a relationship that she was in. But today our guest, David, is here to talk about the fact that he has diaper fetishism. First of all, say a quick hi. Hello, everyone. Hello. Yeah, thanks, David, for reaching out. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for reaching out after this episode aired, too. It was really great to get feedback. By the way, after this episode aired, we were schooled about the difference between fetishes and kinks. So I think it's important for us to make that distinction right now because I was so ignorant to this. <laughs> a kink is the use of props, costumes, and role play to enhance partner intimacy. But a fetish is when the props, costumes, or role play replace the partner and the intimacy, according to Wikipedia. Now, according to the Nookie Box, when someone has a fetish, They experience that attraction to the kinkier side of life, but in a more exclusive way. Fetishes are differentiated by their demanding nature. When it's a fetish and not a kink, the person in question isn't going to be able to enjoy themselves without entertaining that specific desire. Now, these are obviously very general definitions, but I want to make that very clear distinction between fetishes and kinks. So our guest today, again, David, says he indeed has a diaper fetish and would like to share his story. He lives in Philadelphia originally from Pennsylvania. He's 31 years old and he is engaged. First of all, 
David, tell us about your diaper fetishism. How did you first find out about it? It goes back to when I was about 13 or 14 years old. I saw a program on TV in which they highlighted adult babies. For some reason, it stuck with me. Um, for the brief period of time after I saw that, I was not sure what I was experiencing or, or what I was exactly liking. But for some reason, it did stick with me. And at that time, the internet was not what it is today. <laughs> so I did not have Google or, or anything like that that we have today. Um, not until a few years later when Google evolved and I gained enough courage to, to type it in and, and hit search that I realized I was not the only one with this uh, different type of feeling. Uh, I realized there was more others out there like me. Um, so for a couple of years, I thought I was the only one on the planet with this. So, you know, I was just trying to read up on causes for fetishes. And according to psychology today, there are really no causes that has been conclusively established. Some theorists believe that fetishism develops from early childhood experiences in which like an object was presented and that was associated with some form of sexual arousal or gratification. Is that sort of similar to what you experienced? Uh, I did. Uh, sometimes it's associated with abuse or something that happened in childhood. I had a great childhood. My parents were great. Uh, I do not remember anything like this happening that would that would stem back to this mm -hmm. occurrence. Uh, I had an unfortunate event happen a couple of years back in which I sought some counseling and this topic came up. And the only thing that we were able to come up with was perhaps I was going through puberty or some sort of hormones were kicking in when I saw this show. The question I always ask myself is if I did not see that show, would this fetish still have come about or, or would it have emerged in a different way? Um, but and I then it I'll also know that answer. And it also begs the question for some of us who don't have fetishes, are we just – you know, sitting ducks where maybe there is something that will be presented somewhere down the line in our life that arouses us. Uh, so what exactly about diapers arouses you? Is it the image of them? Is it wearing them or what, having someone else wear them? I wish I had a, a really good answer for this, but it, the only thing I come up with is, is I'm drawn to the look uh, and, and to be clear, this has nothing to do with children or pedophilia. As you guys mentioned in your previous episode, I'm not attracted to children. I don't want to be with children. Um, this is adult diapers specifically made for the ABDL community. What does that stand for? ABDL stands for adult baby diaper lover. Um, so I'm drawn to the look, the sound, the feel, and I'm aroused by seeing females in them. I do wear on occasion. It does not have the same sexual gratification as seeing a female. Um, in this case, my partner. So when you discovered that you had this fetish and then later when Google came about, you were able to research about it. Do you remember your first in-person diaper fetish experience? Um, I believe I stumbled across some pictures of others wearing and some articles in which it outlined what exactly this is. And a light bulb kind of went on that this is probably what I was experiencing. And then how did this transfer into real life? Uh, it was not going away. <laughs> so <laughs> and um, as I continued to evolve and as the Internet continued to evolve, I was drawn more towards the ABDL community, more towards the ABDL pictures. And it was sexual gra sexual gratification for me. And were you able to experience this with a real life partner at some point? It wasn't until about five or six years ago when I opened up to an ex. Uh, I've opened up to two people in real life, one being my ex and one being my current partner. And what was like your ex's reaction the first time you did this? I, the first time, uh, I, I did not accept myself for who I was. I was not confident in speaking about it. I kind of just threw it out there, had no plan of how I was going to talk about it. So it's taboo as it is already. Add on to the fact of, of that, that I was not confident and stumbling all over my words. So I think it probably made it more odd than it already is. And I'll be the first to admit that it's certainly odd. Not until I sat down with a counselor did I come to accept myself, to come to accept that this is a small part of who I am. Um, and then when I opened up to, m to my current partner, I was a lot more confident. Uh, I was able to explain it better. 
I was able to explain that this is just a small part of me. I likened it to liking a song or liking an artist or a sports team, food, whatever, whatever you may have. Um, that this is just a small part of something I like. Yeah, you're not defined by it. it so correct. How long were you with your ex before you made this intro? And then how long were you with your current partner before you made this intro? It was about two and a half years before I had opened up to my wow. ex. Wow. And that's what struck me about the episode that you previously did. Uh -huh. Um in, in the discussion you had of when is the right time to tell someone. With my current, I opened up about six or seven months into the relationship. And that was also aided by the fact that I was confident. Yep. Uh, I was speaking to a counselor who helped me open up. I, I don't know what the correct answer is as to when you should open up. I think it's one of those questions that maybe you just know when the right time is. The only advice that I would give is I think that you need to be confident and accept what it is you are experiencing. Um, because if not, it may be a similar experience to how uh, when I opened up to my ex, just stumbling yeah. all over the place. I want to go through your, your relationship with your ex where you, you know, were together for two and a half years. Take us, walk us through that. What was going on in your mind for the first two and a half years that made you ultimately come out and tell her this? It was very, um, I guess uncomfortable would be the right word. I knew that I wanted something more than just the vanilla type stuff. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I wanted to to move towards my fetish, but um, I would just say that it, I was not complete. It was, I was not completely myself in the relationship. Mm. Um, there were times where uh, I, I I don't think I was fully engaged. Um, because I, I, first of all, I didn't accept myself. So I was not, oh, uh, I don't think I was a hundred percent confident in everything I was doing. It sounds like it's more than a small part of who you are because it's, it, if you're not feeling like yourself when you're not, you know, involved in the fetish. I think it's a small part of who I am in, in the, in the grand scheme of things when it comes to how often I seek this or, or what I'm looking for when it comes to this. I, I've never had the experience where I, I told somebody and they said, okay, it's either your fetish or me. Yep. Mm. I would like to think that if I love that person, I would be able to say, try and come up with a compromise where maybe it's me on the internet, um, looking at pictures or wearing on my own when they're not around, but I've never been presented with that situation. So I don't know how I would react. So David, when you approached your ex with this, uh, with this fetish, walk us through that whole scenario. I think it's it was one of those things where for numerous weeks and days I said, all right, I'm going to do it today. Uh -huh. And I, that day would go by and I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, so for numerous, I, numerous days as in two and a half years. <laughs> correct. <laughs> two and a half years later. <laughs> so eventually when I did it, it just came out. I had no plan whatsoever. I didn't even know it was going to come out, um, which I think led to – were, and were you guys she, were you guys at dinner? Were you in the middle having sex? What was, no, we were when was just this? sitting on our couch having a conversation. Okay. What, do you remember what you said? Were you just like, I want to wear diapers or I want to see you in I diapers? I just – I have a diaper fetish is what I said. Okay. So it's just – And at first I, I – she definitely thought I was just joking around. Got it. Right. Okay. And then when – at what point did she realize that you were serious? Um, when I further went to explain it, gave some background information, again, stumbling through everything, having no plan whatsoever, I'm not even really sure what exactly I was seeking out of it. My initial hope was that she would come back and say, oh, I like that too, which was a very small remote percentage. <laughs> but, uh, the other hope was that she said, oh, well, I'm into this and we yeah. can come to a compromisation from oh, there. Like have her own thing that she's done yes. with. And yes. so what was her reaction? She said she said to me that she needed some time to process it. Okay. She and to her credit, she she did some research. Okay. She had some preconceived notions as I think many people do. Yep. Um but upon doing some research, I think she realized it wasn't that big of a deal, especially with with how I go about it. I mean, some people sure live it to the extreme, live it every right. day. That's not, not me. Like you still so, were down for vanilla sex and like other correct, things. It wasn't correct. like this is the only thing I'm ever going to do. Correct. And as you had mentioned earlier, a fetish is something somebody uses for sexual gratification. Other things 
I don't need this just to, to gain sexual gratification. I'm turned on by other quote unquote, more normal things, whatever normal is defined as, but <laughs> I guess more mainstream type things. Yeah. It, this was not just what I, the only thing I could use or the only thing I, I needed. Um, but ultimately she said, this is not something that I can do. This is not something for me. And, and we stayed together for six, seven months longer. And I, I'm sure this had a little part of the reason we broke up, but there were some other factors that went into it that were more serious than this. So would you just look at like ported stuff? Correct. Okay. Correct. She wasn't down to like experiment. Uh, Correct. I'm a pretty pragmatic person. So I like to talk about logistics <laughs> since sure. this is the first time you may, you were presented with possibly an opportunity to try this out with a, a partner how did you think this would play out in your head uh, logistically, I'm speaking? So you would see her in diapers, get turned on, and then take off her diapers to have sex? Correct. Okay. That's how I envisioned it. Would she dance around in diapers? Uh, or more she... just normal everyday activities. So you, in your ultimate fantasy world, would your partner be walking around the house in diapers and then turn you on and then you guys would go in the bedroom and have sex? Correct. Ah, okay. Yeah. So then your current fiance, what was her reaction and how did you present it? I know it was much more mindful. She had a similar reaction. I, I was able to present it a little bit more extensively. I was able to present it in a more confident way and presented it in in a way that I knew what I wanted and, and presented it to that to her. Uh, I was able to explain that this is what I consider a small part of me. This is not something that needs to happen every single time we decide to have sex or something that I need in order for sexual gratification. And I think she was hesitant at first, but then agreed to slowly start incorporating it into uh, our sexual activity. And it helped her open up as well to some of the things that she was into. And, and those are a little bit more common and mainstream type things. Got it. So she was open, which was different Correct. than your ex. Correct. Correct. And it, it did take a little bit of time to, to get her comfortable with it. She's definitely more open. Do you think she likes it or do you think she's doing it because I think if she we you? unfortunately broke up. I don't think she would continue. Got it. I know for me, but I think I could speak for her as well, that it keeps things interesting. It's a little different. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's to say the, the least. Same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and as I said earlier, I certainly understand that. And I understand that there's going to be people that always find it disgusting. And, and that's okay. Were you guys already engaged? We were not. You were not. Okay. So you guys got engaged after you had this conversation. What exactly happened in this conversation when you spoke to her? What were the words that came out of your mouth? Uh, I have something to tell you. I was able to give her the background information first. I was able to tell her that this is not something I need every single sexual experience. I think she was a little bit hesitant and scared about the baby aspect of it, that some people act as the adult baby. I don't think that was anything that she wanted to participate in. I, I just think that I had a better plan and spoke with more confidence this time around as opposed to the first. And certainly it was somebody different. So she had different thoughts to my, my ex. But I would say that those are the, the main things that were different. And what were you guys doing when you had this conversation? Um, we were just having a serious conversation about just going back and forth about about sex. Okay, so it's more relevant potentially than correct, the first correct. time. It, when it was just like just, on the couch and it was going to be a joke. It did yeah. not come out of nowhere, correct. Got it. And then when you, you say you get turned on by watching your partner in, in diapers, what is the gratification you get from you yourself wearing diapers? I don't get as sexually turned on when I do it. I, I think it's more of a, a stress relief type thing for me. Oh. I'm in the finance sector. I work long hours. I do a decent amount of traveling. And for me, I think sometimes it's just kind of like some people may have a glass of wine. So you, you would come home – from a long day at work, and then put on some diapers. I would say this happens once, maybe twice a month. What's the feeling that you get from this that you, is the release? I guess somewhat of a little bit of security and comfort. But again, I think it goes back to stress relief and, and just escaping from normal everyday type things. Got it. Uh, super interesting. So when you – let's talk about present day, sure. your sex life with your fiancé. Describe that. You know, I love to get graphic and get all the details. So <laughs> describe that for us. As far as it relates to the fetish? Yeah, like I guess – and not even relating to the fetish, but how many how many times okay. a week you guys you know engage in the fetish? Um, three or four times a month, maybe if that. Sometimes more, sometimes less. 
depending on how busy our schedules are. And is it you initiating and requesting? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's her surprising me. I think it's, yeah, I think for her, it's nice to have that fallback that she knows that she can turn me on at a moment's notice, I guess. I mean, you don't have to tell us like how much you have sex, but like, what's, do you think like roughly percentage wise you're engaging in this diaper play versus just traditional sex more? I would say traditional is 80, 20. Okay. How long has it been since you guys engaged in diaper fetishism? Very close to two years since I brought it up to her. And then I'd say a year and three quarters, maybe since the first time it happened. So since the first time it's happened, because we all know sex lives can change, mm-hmm. has this fetish transpired in any way, you know, more than just her wearing it? I mean, we have done some fun role play type things, mm. but nothing serious. She's into... Um, vibrators, handcuffs, blindfolds. Okay. So that's more introduced than it was before into your sex life? That is, yes, that is also part of our sex life as well. Previously, you had mentioned the ABDL community. What does that stand for? ABDL stands for adult baby diaper lover. And have you explored more into this community? There is a website called FetLife, which you may or may not yep. be familiar with. It's very similar to a Facebook type um, type thing. There's groups you can join. There's people near you you can meet. There's events, um, gatherings. There is two or three big conventions a year. I have not attended any of this yet, so I, I cannot speak too much as far as that experience goes. But I do know that there are stuff around the country in, in each segment of the, of the country, I guess you could say. I'm just putting myself in the shoes of your fiance, and I, mm-hmm. I'm going to get really real here. If this was presented to me by my partner and I was open to it, my only, I guess not concern, but question would be, where is this going to lead to? Because it might start with this, but it could become something bigger later that I may not be able to handle. Have you guys had this sort of conversation? It's time to take a quick break so we can tell you about our current sponsor, Care Of, a monthly subscription vitamin service made from effective quality ingredients personally tailored to your exact needs. Did you know that 90% of people fall short of FDA recommended guidelines for at least one vitamin or nutrient? Care of made it super easy and fun to figure out what vitamins and supplements you need simply by taking a short quiz on their website. The recommendations are based on clinical research and traditional medicine with input from doctors and nutrients, so no BSing there. My results showed that I needed a boost in my energy, and that's exactly what I got. So I received a 30-day supply shipped right to my door, and all the vitamins and supplements were individually wrapped, which was super convenient. So listen up, for dateable listeners only, you can get 25% off your first month of personalized care of vitamins by visiting takecareof.com and entering the code dateable. That's spelled D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. Now back to the show. My only, I guess not concern, but question would be, where is this going to lead to? Because it might start with this, but it could become something bigger later that I may not be able to handle. Have you guys had this sort of conversation? That did come up. And I ensured her that I've had this for almost 15 years, I believe, at the time when I introduced it to her. And nothing else has come about since. Gotcha. Uh, That's not, I I don't know what tomorrow brings, but I don't think I'm going to stumble across something else. I mean, maybe I'll present her something with that I want to try, but I don't think it would be a fetish. Tell me how you feel about this sort of category of, uh, of, you know, what psychologists would call fetishistic disorders. They would say that fetishes are all disorders. How do you feel about that statement? It's interesting. I don't, when it comes, I cannot speak about some of the other fetishes. I'm not as, as up to speed and, and don't know all the ins and outs of everything else. I see them come across fet life once in a while, but as far as this goes, uh, I don't think it's a disorder for me. Mm-hmm. I think it becomes a disorder when 
it's preventing people from doing family type activities, employment type stuff, priorities and responsibilities. When it completely takes over your life. Correct. Correct. I was so many thoughts going through my mind because Julie and I have a friend who uh, was propositioned for a balloon fetish. And she mm-hmm. was telling us how he later found he was like started a Facebook group for people who had the same fetish and one person joined the group and they ended up getting married. And so I, I you know, to me, it, to, if I had a specific fetish, which I'm guessing I I absolutely do. I just haven't found it yet. I would just join that group and find people who already have that similar fetish just to just to make it easier for me. But that wasn't your approach at all, because, again, you're saying it's it's it doesn't consume your life. Um, so it's just an interesting, yeah, a different it approach. Probably really comes down to like how essential is this for you? Because like correct, you were I saying, think that's exactly. Yeah, like you were saying, like yeah, if like this person wasn't down with it, like I don't know fully what would have happened, but it, I wasn't like oh, I'm gonna pick the fetish or you. Like it wasn't necessarily right. black and white, but like we don't know the situation with the guy from the balloons. Like maybe it was a bigger part of his life. Yeah. yeah. And I, I would venture to guess that if I said, hey, I'm an adult baby and this is something I need, I don't think my fiance would still be with me. Right. Right. That yeah. was not something she was attracted to playing baby or the mommy role. Right. Like it's like one of many. Yeah, I think it's like how you present it and then where you seek it out. It's like I think like, yeah, if you're not dating someone currently, why not explore these sites? But then the other downside of like putting it out as the only thing is that like, do you have other stuff in common or is it just that you have this fetish that you share? I'm I'm totally going to oversimplify the situation, but I'm just trying to relate in my own mind. And Mm -hmm. what I can think of is I love sushi. I love eating sushi, but I don't need it all the time. And if I meet someone fantastic who doesn't eat sushi or only wants it occasionally, it's not a deal breaker, but it makes me very happy when they can engage in some sushi eating with me. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's I think that's a a fair assessment to put it in more common terms. And I think also that if you found somebody who is into sushi and they wanted it all the time that you may get sick of it. And that's similar to how I feel right now. Yeah. And then you get mercury poisoning too so there's there's... (laughs) i think some of some of those out there that are going to be listening have probably seen some some shows on tv or heard some things maybe on a podcast that really highlight some of the extreme cases and that's obviously for ratings so that's immediately what they think but i would say for 75 to 80 percent of the community probably even higher it's a small percentage of their lives that's a really good segue to takeaways because i think for me, one of the takeaways I had from this was that this is just one piece of you. It's one small piece. It doesn't totally dictate your entire sex life. Your fiance now kind of has this in her back pocket to like know how to turn you on and kind of make you happy, right? So I think if you are engaging in this stuff that may seem a little outside of your typical comfort zone and you're down with it it could be an ex- a way to really bond with your partner further like we talked to our friend that dated the guy in the balloons uh with the balloon fetish and she went to like a balloon store and it became like yeah. super <laughs> sexy with him so yeah. it's like it kind of gives you like an opportunity to try something and see if you also get turned on by it or get yeah, turned yeah. on by your partner being turned on absolutely at the end of the day it's like we kind of talked about this on samantha's episode it's like how you say it is everything and mm-hmm. how you talk about it with your partner i mean obviously we don't have your current fiance but i'm assuming like she looked at the big picture and was like okay there's so many aspects about david that i love like can i make this work and like how do i make it work so it's more just keeping this open mind with things that like might seem out of the ordinary at first if there is like a larger person at stake I don't, again, it goes back to when I introduced it. I don't know what the right time is, but after six months, she knew that I was a a productive member of society. I have (laughs) what I consider a really good job. I have a master's degree, so I'm still driven. I I, consider myself successful. And again, this is a small part of who I am. So I think you hit it right on that she did see it that way. There's probably people out there that may not be able to to do that. And, and that is what it is. But in this case, I, I, I was fortunate. I think the problem comes with like, you're on like Tinder, for example, and someone like leads with this and you know nothing about them. Like your willingness to even like 
evaluate it is so much lower because you just you don't have that background. So correct. I would agree with that. I think my most prominent takeaway from this discussion would be it's uh, it's all about creating a a safe place for your partner. And I I think ultimately that's what a partnership is. So what does that safe place mean? It means it's when you you two are together, it's a safe place to talk about your what's going on in your life, what's making you happy, what's making you unhappy. And part of that could be fetishes. Part of that could be things that are considered abnormal by society. But you know what? When you're in a partnership, you and your partner are creating what's normal for you. That's your universe. So why, you know, I think we should stop putting, stop letting societal standards and norms to intoxicate our own relationships. Because when you're in a, in a partnership, you two are the ones making the rules. Yeah, I think that's important as well. And uh, when I was seeking counseling and I brought this up and I said, I know that this is the most normal thing. Well, she stopped me right there and she said, well, define normal to me. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Who in society can define what normal is? It's all what you're exposed to, all your uh, feelings towards something. And I think uh, one other important thing that I'd like to mention is this is something that stays in in our bedroom or in our private life. Yep. This is not, not something we're exposing others to or making other people out there feel uncomfortable about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really, I think the other like point that kind of plays out. I love this whole like what is normal because I agree it's mm-hmm. just such a like word at this point that's almost all like stigmatized. But um, yeah. one thing that like I think you brought up, David, is like media's perception is a certain way with people that have fetishes and kinks. In the reality, like we went to a sex party as well. We talked to a bunch of couples and a lot of them were saying like, yeah, they go to these sex parties, but the 90% of their other time, they're just like cooking, doing their job, like doing like pretty traditional stuff. So like at the end of the day, like it's easy to judge someone when you hear this one thing, but sure. this person is a much larger thing than just their fetish or kink. Yeah, that's the point I was trying to make earlier on in this podcast was this this is a small part of me. This is definitely does not define who I am. Um, and I don't think it ever will or, and shouldn't. Well, there's a sort of a disconnect here. And I want to go back to when we asked you to tell us about yourself and your diaper fetishism, you wrote to us and said, you know, I consider myself to be a productive member of society. And then the rest of what you wrote sounds exactly like the pro- dating profiles I see on on these dating apps. So you wrote, you know, I work in the financial sector. I own a house. I am fortunate enough to own a beach house. I love sports and cooking and every everyday things like <laughs> everyone else. This sounds like every other dating profile I've read. So it almost makes me feel like there's a disconnect here. We feel like we should be unique, but also at the same time, we're trying to prove to each other that we're normal by society standards. So why don't we take all that out? Because that sounds so generic. And in our dating profiles, maybe not state our fetishes, but what makes you different? What does make you unique from all the other profiles out there? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Um, in in providing those answers to your questions, I'd I, I was without really meeting you or knowing you. I wanted to make sure that that was clear that this is just a small part of who I am. I do have other interests. I do have other likes, yeah. but I could see how it is taken as a, a dating profile type. <laughs> but I see how that like that kind of goes back to like what society tells us about people with fetishes and kinks. So that's kind of if almost why like maybe you felt the need to be like, okay, this is like who I am, and this is one piece. Yeah, I think. Uh, I, I have accepted that this is a part of who I am. I'm confident about it. I'm able to talk about it now. A couple of years ago, I would have never even thought to reach out to you to to follow up on this. Yeah. Um, and I, but I do think that there is something to the fact that we all want to seek approval from others. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely. Whether it's with a fetish or with just normal everyday type things. Yep. I definitely appreciate you, got, you reaching out because yes. I think this is really great for people to hear – Because I think like the Samantha side was an interesting perspective of getting propositioned for something. But it's interesting to hear the perspective of someone that is going through this and just like how this is in their whole world and what it really means from your perspective. So thank you for reaching out. As I mentioned earlier, I was really um, turned to the fact that of when and and how you should approach somebody. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was the difference in my life, how I did it with my ex compared to my current fiance. And, and that's the reason I did, I did reach out because I don't really know if there is a, a set time or a set way to do it. 
Yeah. The last takeaway I have would be education and learning. I, I think for everyone is just whatever your partner presents you with, go learn about it first. I so respect your fiance for saying, yeah. let me think about it and get back to you. And right. sa- same with your your ex. She said the same thing. Let me think about it and get back to you. I think it's great to to just educate yourself well, that's on always a good what it way is. To approach things if you're unsure is like, let me think about it because you're not committing like, oh yeah, I'll do this without knowing anything or no. Because I think like the hard no is like really tough for people to hear, especially if they're trying to open up about something. Yeah, yeah I think that there maybe have there maybe were some preconceived notions, but after she did some research, which I, I certainly appreciate, uh, she found out it's fairly harmless. I'm not harming her or myself and. There's nothing wrong, um, criminal, criminally speaking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I guess just to end this, uh, what advice would you give to someone introducing a fetish? I would say the first thing that you need to do is accept yourself, accept who you are, accept that what percentage of a part of you this is, what you're looking for, um, what you're seeking. When you do open up, I think you need to be confident. I think you need to be open to questions or preconceived notions coming back to you. I think those are the most important things. Each relationship is different. So only the person in the relationship is going to know when a, the right and wrong time is. Mm-hmm. I I would advise against maybe not keeping it a secret for 20 years. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also like balancing it with like not too soon until they know you either. So correct. Yeah, that's great advice. Well, well, thank you so much, David. We really appreciate you doing this. I appreciate you reaching back out to me. I thought you guys did a fantastic job with the the previous podcast, and I really enjoyed speaking with you today. And now my Google search is just going to be bombarded with diaper fetish websites because I'm so curious (laughs) now. I'm gonna I'm gonna get off the phone and just read all about it today. Thank you again for your time, and I think for our listeners. We'd love to hear from you what fetishes you have, but also have you experienced a fetish that really consumed your life? We haven't gone that side of the spectrum yet. Has it become so much a part of you that it's hindered you from you know performing daily life activities? We want to hear from you with that. Any other last thoughts you want to say? Uh, no, other than the fact uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come on and explain this side of it. And again, the, the first episode you guys did was was great and i appreciate the the coverage and and the way you went about it fantastic thanks so much david for your time and uh we're gonna wrap this up stay Stay dateable. dateable your action item for this week is to research as many fetishes as you can our own judgment usually comes from a place of ignorance or not knowing so the more you can educate yourself on the types of fetishes that people have the less you will judge someone in the future. This episode of Dateable is brought to you by 500 Brunches. 500 Brunches connects like-minded people with similar interests to meet in real life over brunch. You answer a quick questionnaire about your interests and how you spend your time, and then they'll match you in small groups of six to eight at a brunch spot in San Francisco. Get a free entry into a brunch now by signing up at 500brunches.com and using the code DATEABLE. If you didn't know already, we have a revamped website with articles, videos, and content all about modern dating. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We've had some great feedback about how actionable these episodes are. So check them out on our website or iTunes Music. Also, visit the site today to see the latest about coaching, where we connect you with dateable approved experts to help with everything from dating profile reviews, coaching, and even gathering real feedback about your dating style in a personalized and affordable way. To connect with us, visit datablepodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all under Dateable Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and auto-download the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast player so you never miss an episode.